Okay, can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the, the the images of a polio virus are incredibly beautiful, <laughs> but they wow. all there are loads of them, and they all look incredible. They all look very different. So I don't know what it means really, but it's um, that that's an image of a um, a polio vi virus type one capsid molecule. And, but I thought it was a nice way to start, but it, I suppose it's it occurred for me to do something about polio because it's been in the news recently, because it seems to be making some sort of return, but it's hard to say exactly in what way, but I, I will come on to that. So um, just a bit about what it is. It's uh, obviously contagious. It's an enterovirus um, disease, which is, means it occurs in the gastrointestinal tract and it's spread to the central nervous system. And, there, and at that point, it can um, uh, destroy various nerves and muscles and prevents them developing anymore in certain kinds of way. So it can be transmitted directly by fecal oral contact or indirectly by contact with infectious saliva or feces, or, and this is interesting one for 2022 in a way, that's what it seems to be happening, by contaminated mm. sewage or water. And 95%, the, the, both the problem and the benefit of polio in a way is that 95% of cases are asymptomatic. You get it and you don't know that you've got it, but you can pass it on to somebody. Um, so they're carried by the bloodstream into the central nervous system, resulting in the destruction of the motor neurons of the brain stem and potential spinal paralysis. And severe polio, it, poliomyelitis, tends not to kill, it tends to deform. Um, mm. um, so it can result in lower limb deformity. And it, by far the majority of the cases are with very young children. Mm. And in this way, in this, in this way, it's very different to the COVID virus, which generally attacks older people or has severe effects on older people. And it's hard to imagine the fear of polio that occurred from the 1930s onwards, mm -hmm. especially because it had come in waves, especially it was a sort of a summer, very often a, a summer outbreak and uh, whole communities closed down. Um, there, there's one case I just read about where somebody, when he got, a, he got polio very severely, and when he went back home, he found everything that he had had been burnt because they were, you know, concerned about possible contamination. But the you can you can imagine the the kind of psychological shock that that would have somebody, as well as the physical shock of what happened to them. Now this is a horrible diagram I came across. Don't you think that's horrible? It's mm -hmm. a, a, an artist. In, I don't know what it is. An artist's impression. But these are what's seen as the typical contractures of polio, and this, whilst it's of an adult, it's um, really mainly for for very young children. So it's contracture of the hip and effects of the hip. It's, I don't know why the callus on the knee from crawling. Um, it's the uh, deformity of the knee and the leg. And there's something called an equinus, equ equinus deformity, which means presumably that your foot looks a bit like a horse's foot. And that's something I had. I had the equinus deformity amongst other things. I also had the effect on my hip where my um, hip joint um, carved out a false uh, place for it to go. The ball of it carved out a false place. I only found that out when I went to the St. Thomas's Hospital when I was in my 50s, um, uh, it, as it was the only post-polio clinic in the country then. And they did a specialist x-ray and showed me what had happened. So it, it's the sort of thing that happens to you. And surprisingly, you think you'd be really interested in finding out about it but you're not you just don't know what's happened to you and you tend you don't really want to know um this is a picture of me mm. in, <laughs> in what's round, a, about okay. nine, round about 1954 i mean it's at mri um and i'm in an adult i was in an adult ward there to have operations you can see on my right leg um with my rather rather quaint little slippers that I had on the other foot as well. Something I noticed just looking at this recently was, can you see the white thing dangling at the top of the bed? 
that was for a radio um and that really really was a, was wonderful to me to be able to listen to the radio it only had a couple of channels on it i think mm. it was wonderful to be able to listen to it and i can certainly remember you know the the adults generally were very very good to me they really were nice but it was the isolation and not knowing what was going on and I, i'd often just cry myself to sleep a lot so even <laughs> i look pretty cheerful there but i wasn't all the time and i can remember wait you didn't have visits all the time there you, you remember you had them at specific times they'd have to come at some like six o'clock in the evening and they used to have these screens at the end of the ward and i can remember because my dad was very tall I, he would look over them and wave at me just before they were coming. I'd always look forward to that. Anyway, this is this is the bit that I, I find hard. Uh, could you read? Could you read it out, Jackie? Are you okay to do that? Yes, fine. This is from. By the way, this, this is from um, when before she got um, dementia, before she died. Um, I got my mum uh, Celia Leach to write her her story, her story. And this is her bit about when, when I got polio. Okay. Bernard became ill and feverish and I called in Dr. Marcus who lived opposite us. He couldn't decide what the matter was. Then another specialist who couldn't diagnose the problem. Then finally a baby doctor from the Duchess of York hospital who I knew, who immediately decided to have Bernard in her hospital. It's, oh. All right. So that's that's the Duchess of York Hospital um, uh, from a, a 1953 photo of it. Um, it's interesting that it was it was originally built. It was originally built because babies weren't taken into hospital because they thought it was too dangerous for them. They were treated at home, and it was one of the first um, uh, doctors to have um, been passed by Manchester University who established this uh, um, specifically for for mothers who where children had rickets initially. Anyway, okay. Okay. That evening, Frank drove us to the Duchess of York. One of the nurses put him on a table and left him uncovered, which worried me. I was asked to go into another room to extract my milk. And whilst I was there, I heard one nurse say to another, guess what? We've just taken in a polio case. That was how I found out what was the matter with Bernard. I was devastated. For seven weeks, Bernard, who was only five months old when it happened, lay in an isolation ward where we could only see him through glass. And every night for those seven weeks, Frank and I drove to the hospital. And every night the sun shone. And every day I died, died a thousand deaths. I did go back to the shop each day and whenever a customer asked about Bernard, I couldn't answer them. Eventually, we were able to bring home our baby. I had had to stop feeding him as my milk had dried up, but at least the fever had gone. But what about the consequences of polio? He could move his arms, but not his legs. When he began to crawl, he would use his arms to move and drag his legs along. It was heartbreaking. Then one day as he moved onto the lino from the carpet, one of his legs twitched. I knelt down beside him and wept and prayed. Was this a sign of life coming back? There followed years of visits to physiotherapists, to the hospital, to the makers of calipers, to the shoemakers. Anyway, that, that's it, thank you. You can see why. It just triggers me every time. So that's why no, I just can't totally. read it. No, anyway, I can understand that. So just bringing it up to date, the, something that people who've had polio have got to deal with is what's sometimes called post-polio syndrome, but it's probably more accurately called the la late effects of polio. Um, so it's about usually 30 to 40 years after they've contracted a wild polio virus infection in childhood. And it's related to the aging or death of nerves and muscles. 
that we're compensated for and uh, compensating for the original damage. And this is a, a kind of a typical Daily Mail <laughs> version of it, how polio has returned to haunt its victims in old age. The result is a cruel return of symptoms, meaning that many who battle the effects of withered limbs with light leg irons and built up shoes face the possibility of life in a wheelchair or in the worst cases, reliance on ventilators to supply oxygen to damaged lungs. Well, it wasn't that bad, but it's, um, it, it is probably related to the aging or death of nerves and muscles, which are compensating for the original damage. And it's something that every polio, it, it seems unfair, but that, that's just the way life is, isn't it? The, that, um, the fact that you've, you've, you've overused those muscles that remain tends to have an effect on everything else. And uh, I'm certainly finding that now. Uh, this is how polio was dealt with in um, how the, the number of cases of polio and how I, mine, you can see when the epidemics were, there was a big one. That's mine. That's my spike there, 1947. And there was another one in, in the 1950s as well. It was only really till the mid 1960s that it was it got under control. Uh, which, which is a which is a wonderful thing and which which surprise you know people were desperate for vaccinations then they were desperate for it but there was there was no anti-vax movement then at all because children were at risk and it, it sort of overcame any of those um, concerns about it and here are some of the sort of images that you got this is from America you know join the march of the dimes a, a, an awful lot of it was um, was financed by very, very small donations from people collecting money. It was not a central government thing. And apparently they used to have um, bucket loads of dimes actually sent, which they had to count out and, and, um, and do. But she, she became, uh, I've forgotten the name now, she, she became Linda, Linda Brown. Wow. She became a sort of a, an image of it. And of course, this is an image that probably a lot of people still have which was of um, iron lungs. This was iron mm. lungs in America in 1952. Oh, yes. it, it's just, look, look at the number of them. It, it's just, yes. it's, it's hard to imagine what that was like. It's and real shock. It's, 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 it really hits you, doesn't it? It really does oh. hit you. Mm. And the fact that they're oh. only able to look up through and to, to see through this mirror. <gasps> and they- well, I, I, I had a friend who in fact, had yeah. it and and had to go in Yorkshire. This is had to go to I think it was uh, it wasn't Sheffield or uh, one of the big towns for the iron lung because there weren't many iron lungs around. And she's now in and uh, she's now ninety. And um, she, when did she, when did she get out of it? Um, I, I don't know how long she was in it. She was in she was not a little girl when she got it. She was in her um, uh, late teens, early twenties. When she contracted it uh, in Yorkshire, this was of course because this is where I'm from, and um, uh, she was in the Iron Lung for quite a while. The, I think the last person to be using a, uh, an iron, still using an Iron Lung, that was a more up-to-date version of them, died only a few years ago. You know, that's how really? lot of people stuck in it. Yeah, it was. In fact, it was the first time I I met you, uh, Bernard. I knew you'd had polio by the way you walked. Yeah. Yes. It's oh, a good yes. one, that. I, I, the, no, no, I had a no, very interesting is. story. When, um, when I was walking with uh, my stepdaughter through Moss Side, and she was on skates, and a guy stopped his car, pulled up, very laboriously wound down his window, and he, he introduced himself as Neville and says, I noticed you, you'd had polio. Yes, and he was, he, he, he was the chair of the Manchester Disabled Athletes that um, had a swimming club in um, in Stratford. And I, I wrote on a piece of paper what it was and I went swimming there. And with that group were the ones I went down to Stoke Man Mandeville, where I um, was then chosen to swim for Britain. But hey, that's another story. <laughs> well, Marvellous. This is, this is, that's another chart. Well, I don't want it all, all to be about me, though it obviously is focusing on my experience. But the, does anybody remember these? Yeah. They're outside shops. Yes, you get them, didn't I remember you? them. 
No, yeah. I, no, I don't, I don't remember them. And, and this yeah. one is uh, originally they were were for polio, and you can see he's got a a, a caliper on. Yes, uh, they, they call them braces yes. in America. Uh, though he's got it, I, I I had mine on until I was about five or six, but I've got no photographs of me with my caliper on. I wonder why they didn't do it. anyway. Uh, um, but I, I'm, after the operation, which you saw me in hospital, I was able to to walk um, with, without a caliper. So that was a really big advance for me. But what they did is rather than when polio was gradually conquered, they changed it to the Spastic Society, which is now what it is. Was it what is it known as now? Scope, isn't it? Scope. It would be cerebral oh, palsy. Yeah. Spastic. Yeah, it's they, they, cerebral palsy. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, oh, yes, yeah, cerebral palsy. Yeah. Right. Remember that. But the, the interesting thing is a lot of the, the right, when I started in the disability disabled people's movement, there was there was a charity in Manchester called the Cripples Help Society. You know, it just shows how things have changed, really. Oh, dear. And it took a long time for to get the Spastic Society to change their name, even though yes. people who had cerebral palsy wanted it because it brought the money in on the tins. Yes, yes. So that that's that this um, the Dungaree boys, as it, it was known, is repurposed for the Spastic Society. You can see it on the on the thing that they've got. But imagine you're a young you're a young kid and you go and get a, a, a loaf from the local thing. And there's this out. It's, there's you outside there begging for money. for it. it was really quite surreal, really. Mm. <laughs> now, this is. Um, this, uh, the, there are various autobiographies about um, polio, and this is really comes into the psychology and the sociology of it. So I hope you'll bear with me on this. And this uh, a, a story written by about somebody when he had it. 11 year old Marvin broke his uh, polio impaired leg in a fall and his leg was placed temporarily in a long plaster cast. He wasn't entirely unhappy about this because when he was wearing the cast, strangers often didn't know he was crippled. When Marvin was riding in a cab one day with his mother, the cab driver noticed the cast and asked, how do you break your legs, son, playing football? Mrs. Harris replied this was indeed what had happened. When they got out of the cab, Marvin said to his mother, am I glad you didn't tell him I had polio? They just think I had a broken leg. Mm -hmm. That's the weird thing about it. I can remember walking down the street just where I, I led with one one my my bad leg on the pavement and my good leg in the gutter so oh, I could dear. Walk, so I could walk straight and I, uh... and I could imagine I said and I was imagine wouldn't it be good if I'd been shot down in a in a, in a spitfire or something and I'd, and I'd got the leg injury from that because having an injury through a disease is not as okay as having received an injury when you're older through some sort of brave activity. It just, it's weird how the psychology of that works. And it, it, it played through in the Stoke Mandeville games, you know, which led to the Paralympics because they were for four uh, servicemen who'd been injured during the war. And especially for people who'd had injuries that meant that they were wheelchair users, the wheelchair users, who'd become disabled when they were old were the elite of the disability world. Because it's seen, you're not a disabled person, you're an able-bodied person who became disabled. If you got the disability when you were young, you were a disabled person and your psychology was that of a disabled person. You see the weird way that this works. I'm just trying to explain mm. it to you. Um, this is an, another one as well, I think, which I'll just, just go through. This is from Alan Marshall, who wrote a really good um, biography called I Can Jump Puddles. The other boy was always with me. He was my shadow self, weak and full of complaints, afraid and apprehensive, always pleading with me to consider him, always seeking to restrain me for his old and selfish interests. I despised him, yet he was my responsibility. In all moments of decision, I had to free myself of his influence. I argued with him then. When he would not be convinced, I spurned him in fury and went my way. He wore my body and walked on crutches. I strode apart from him on legs as strong as trees. And I, I did that to a certain extent. I can remember when I was in Barnes Hospital recuperating, which is now turned into flats, um, 
near near um, Kingsway. I don't know if you ever noticed it. And I I when when I was there, I remember I had all these operations. I talked to my legs as if they were different people. <laughs> so I tell I tell my, I I was a bit not as nasty as Alan was to his leg. I used to ask my good leg to look after my bad leg. <laughs> oh. yeah. Um, oh this is the psychology of it as well. A later generation of psychological commentators would label this behavior as passing, hiding their disability from other people. Um, it was characterized as um, amongst 100 polio survivors who took part in an attitude survey, they, they, they categorized them as passers, minimizers, or identifiers. Uh, passers had a disability that was so mild it could easily be hidden in casual social interactions. They could pass to a non-disabled. Minimizers had a moderate disability that was readily recognized by other people. They often used visual adaptive equipment or had to do physical tasks, tasks differently in order to optimally function. They typically minimize the importance of their physical differences. Identifiers were severely disabled by um, severely disabled by acute polo. They generally needed wheelchairs for independent mobility. Sometimes they also needed um, respiratory uh, uh, equipment. They needed to fully identify with their disability in order to make major lifestyle adaptions and successfully cope. Now, I was very much part of that. I, I can remember when I when <laughs> we used to go around to my my uncle and aunt, Uncle Jack and and, and to Joan, and and see uh, because he he'd had a camera and we'd show films of their holidays and whatever, and he'd taken a photo in which I was walking in it, and for the first time, for the first time, I noticed I had a limp, and I was I was devastated by it. I realised that's how I looked to other people. So in future, when I was approaching things like glass doors, I would close my eyes so I didn't look at myself. Oh, if yeah. if I if I saw somebody with a limp on the, on uh, coming down the street, I crossed to the other side of the road road because I thought two two people with limps looked weird. So it, it was it, all this was. I I remember the first party I went the parties I went to as a teenager, when, which you can imagine on top of everything else being a teenager. I'd always walk around the side of the room so they couldn't see the disability. It's uh, it has a big psychological effect on you. Anyway, I better move on this because time's but moving you, on. But you use your big personality, though. Well, it means you you. Well, I th I think what helped me is that I I actually, I actually um, overcame that I think a lot by getting involved in disabled people's things where I became not proud of my disability but not ashamed of it and i don't think i ever have, have been since then but um polio didn't just stop in the nine uh, early uh, 1950s this was um the whole pol polio outbreak in um 1956 um where i think several hundred people ended up in hospital because of it and they um they there you can see the the cues of people's uh, going for the vaccination on the on the right and somebody taking it uh taking the it was the oral vaccine thing they used there with the sulk one um but it that was how terrified people were of it and this is because people hadn't got the hadn't got the vaccination these they they, they, they sent up a separate batch of them to hull to enable them all to get it and this is one in um in rochdale in 1976 um, when there was a, a, an outbreak of um, polio in um, in Rochdale, and there's a picture of there of uh, Ian Grimshaw receives an anti-polio lump from nurse Barbara Chan Chandwick. Oh yeah, it's a polio lump. Yes. Chandwick. Um, so apparently, nine thousand adults and eleven thousand children were vaccinated in the in the uh, during this particular outbreak of it. So. To get rid of it, you need to have the vaccine, and that's very fortunate that happened with polio, and it's not quite so so much. Fun. So the the reemergence of polio. So it was eliminated effectively in um, in the US and the UK between. But in the UK, it was two thousand and three before it was it was eliminated. 
Um, but this year it was found in wastewater, in sewage, both in New York and London and various other places as well. Also in, 19, in 2021, wild polio virus, that is not from a case of person, somebody had already had it somewhere and secondary cause of it, caused paralysis in two countries where it had never been contained and another 21 where it had rebounded. Uh, uh, and as I say, because there are several hundred who carry or carried the asymptomatic infections, they've been circulating since February 22 in London. What are liable to be the long term effects on that? It's not known. But the um, what the London Health Authority immediately did, they 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 offered booster doses of vaccine to any kids nine years or younger. And the outbreaks of this have been mainly in areas where there's been a low take up of vaccines. People go don't have their general vaccines when they feel enough other people have been vaccinated to to give them coverage of it. Um, what was that called when this this was put forward as the the herd immunity theory? And of course, but it um, it always comes back to the lack of immunization to immunization coverage. A bit of good news to end with, though it doesn't sound like good news. Um, I, I was going through some literature on polio because one of the things I don't know is how long do people with polio live till? Uh, which in kind of a moderate sort of way is interesting to me. And I came across Celia Bell Yoda. And this was, be, I came across an article about her before she died. She died age 100 in 2016 well i thought hey that's something to aim for at least mm -hmm. uh, though in her obituaries none of them mentioned the fact that she had polio which really surprised me there you go but mm -hmm. she um she had very similar polio to me and um she she died aged 100 so it, 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 it does look like polio people with polio can survive because all, all of my friends every everyone without exception that had polio They've all died. They've all died fairly young as well. So that was maybe one of the reasons I thought that was that. But so that's that. Phew, did it. Did it in time. Thank you well. for sharing that, Bernard. It was very moving, actually. I mean, it was informative, but it was also yes. very moving. It and... takes a lot of strength to do that, Bernard. I'll give you a yeah. big hand. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. No, I remember really... it all happening, you know. Uh, uh, this friend of mine picked it, picked it, picked it. She was staying with some a relative in the Midlands, and it was running rife there at the time, and that's where she picked it up. But she's still alive now, and she's uh, ninety. <laughs> Bless her heart. Mm. So. Mm. And it, it's interesting talking about the the hiding of these things. I went through mm. a lifetime of that with epilepsy. Where yeah. uh, the, you know, the, uh, and especially as a young child from the age of four uh, onwards, and the similar things. There are no photographs of me until I'm fourteen, and uh, because of the the effects. I mean, I'm not going on about me with this, but there are similar things in terms of how society, exactly as you said, looks on these things that are not caused through heroic behavior or accident or things that uh, seem to be i don't know connected with some kind of uh, of uh, of skill or whatever it's just something you're born with or or we 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 absorb mm. but i think because society is very it doesn't understand or how to how to respond to disability and relate. There's another side to the photograph bit that occurred to me, perhaps sounds a bit. When Jenny was very small, she always had her hands in front of her face to look at things. I don't, security or whatever. And when we took photos of her, we'd wait for the second that the hands weren't there. So consequently, we haven't got any photos of what actually her, hmm. that kind of behavior was, which, early on before we knew about the um, neurodiversity it's called now isn't it Derek something like that it was you know just it was part of her but we didn't <laughs> we've no record of it but it's part of who she was well, just as the time's coming up just one point I want to make 
I, a really important thing um, happened to me when I was about 17. And I, I went into a pub and gone down to Stratford for some reason. Well, no, to watch plays, obviously. <laughs> and the, the, um, there was a, a guy in the, uh, in the pub who had an, an artificial leg. And he was the center of a group of people. And every time he made a joke, he banged his head and it made a noise. And what I realized there, he was putting everybody at their ease by being at ease with his own disability. And that's a very big yeah. lesson you learn. That if the, the, the less nervous you are, the less self-conscious you are, the easier other people will find it.